My name is Gary Polk. I'm the executive director of the South Bay Entrepreneurial Center. I'd like to welcome you here to our crowdfunding breakfast 2016. Um, this is a quite a week in the world of um, entrepreneurial finance. And uh, I have a couple notes here. In the LA Times on Monday, I'm not sure how many of you were able to see this, but there's an article that talks about startups in stock. LA Times Monday, and our moderator, Mr. Mark Hiraide is mentioned and about his book. So I'll let Mark tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, I did a little research and uh, there's some information out there. How many people will take the LA Business Journal? LA Business Journal, a couple people. It says, will crowds form to fund firms? Will crowds form to fund firms? It says, the good news is that Los Angeles is now perfectly positioned to become a financial tech capital. And all entrepreneurs know we always need access to capital, so that's a good thing. It'll be interesting to see if Los Angeles actually does become that financial tech capital. There's some misconceptions about crowdfunding. The SBDC put together a form about 10 crowdfunding misconceptions, and I'm just going to read them out, and hopefully today the panel will clear up some of these misconceptions. One says that crowdfunding is just panhandling. A second, the best thing about crowdfunding is money, maybe. Uh, it's not as good as VC money. VC, by the way, is venture capitalists or other people's money. It's not as good as VC money. Here's one, the crowd is waiting for me on the crowdfunding platforms. The crowd is waiting for me. Hmm, wonder about that one. Uh, if you use an equity platform now, I'll scare off later investors. Interesting. And then the last one here, there's nowhere for me to get help. So well, we know that's wrong. So with that, I'm going to segue over to Mark Hiraide. Mark is our board secretary of the SBEC, as well as a partner with the uh, law firm of Mitchell, Silverberg, and Nup. Yes. Did I get it right? All right. So Mark Hiraide, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to move over here. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, all of you are kind of special friends of the uh, South Bay Entrepreneurial Center, and so we've invited you uh, to participate with us in uh, this event this morning. Um, the South Bay Entrepreneurial Center was kind of a uh, labor of love of uh, my former partner, Lee Pedalon, who for uh, most of his career had ambition to create uh, this center and was finally able to do so uh, shortly before his passing a few years ago. So um, for all of you who have participated uh, with uh, Lee and, and with us in uh, making the South Bay Entrepreneurial Center a success, uh, thank you so much. And you know, we hope we can uh, 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 reward you uh, uh, this morning with <coughs> some insight into crowdfunding. Uh, we're very fortunate to have um, a very experienced group of individuals who uh, know this space very well. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves, but in short, um, we have uh, somebody who was involved in one of the, I think, one of the most high-profile uh, campaigns, uh, crowdfunding campaigns um, on the social media side, uh, Taylor McPartland. Uh, we have an accountant uh, from the accounting firm of uh, Armenino, Dean Kiambo. Uh, I don't hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, we have <coughs> one of our own, uh, one of our own companies uh, who has received mentorship from the SBEC, who has uh, conducted his own crowdfunding uh, campaign, uh, non-equity crowdfunding campaign, James Lynn. And then we have a representative from probably one of the, uh, the most prominent uh, platforms, crowdfunding platforms out there today, uh, StartEngine. Uh, Alan is uh, from StartEngine. StartEngine is based here in Los Angeles. Uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, start with Taylor and ask Taylor just to um, provide a little background and uh, tell us what you've been doing in this space. Yeah. Uh, well. Thank you, Mark, for the invitation to come out this morning. Thanks for everybody for letting me be here. 
Is that better? Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I'm an advisor for, an organiz for a, uh, a crowdfunding agency called CrowdfundX that uh, was, was the um, agency involved in the Elio Motors campaign along with Start Engine. Uh, I ran the company for about five years, and so during that time we um, were fortunate enough to be involved in many campaigns, both on the reward side with uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, and then more recently on the equity crowdfunding side through Regulation A+. Plus. Um, and now, you know, as Title III is coming around, we're getting into that space as well. Uh, most of what I do now is a lot of this. I'm, I'm very bullish on crowdfunding. I love evangelizing it. I love speaking about it. And I'm very excited to uh, see where it goes from here and to help people along the way. So um, thanks. Great. My name is Dean, um, partner at Armenino. And, uh, you know, I'm actually our partner in charge of business development. Our partner who heads up our crowdfunding practice couldn't be here today, so he sent me. We do do a lot of our pursuits together. Um, some of our clients include companies like uh, Patch of Land, uh, Fundrise, uh, Lending Home, uh, very large crowdfunding organizations. Last year we probably talked to over 35 uh, organizations that are very interested in crowdfunding. It seems like every day, and it doesn't matter what, what niche you're in, whether it's SaaS, whether it's real estate, um, you know, consumer products, crowdfunding is here, and, and I'm glad to hear that people are bullish on it. Um, our biggest thing is, is make sure you align yourself with the right expert. Uh, my name is James Lin. I founded, co-founded a company called Zenmount. And um, three years ago, I was just an average uh, programmer sitting at home, and um, a product idea struck me. I um, do some uh, sketching, doodling on a scratch paper, and um, sat for a few days, and went up to look for a product designer to see about making it, um, making the product. And it's been three years. We worked together with the product designer, and um, we uh, finally uh, have a uh, working prototype. It's um, getting a finalized design and ready to go into um, production. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Jebson. I am the director of business development for Start Engine. Work closely with Taren, uh, Taylor and uh, CrowdfundX, um, as we are the platform that allows companies to um, raise capital through the New Jobs Act. And it's under two different regulations, which I'm sure we'll get um, pretty deep into, and Regulation CF that actually just got passed on Monday morning, or enacted on Monday morning, and Regulation A+, which Taylor mentioned earlier. So. Uh, my job as the director of business development is to find startups, companies at really any stage, which is really the benefit of these new regulations, to come on and take advantage of the new Jobs Act and what it allows companies to do in the alternative funding space. Great. Thank you. So um, clearly we've got a lot of experience. Uh, this is a completely new uh, phenomena that is crowdfunding. And as Alan mentioned, uh, you know, yesterday or Monday, May 16th, was the day. That was the effective date of what's known as Title III crowdfunding, Title III under the JOBS Act. So let me just kind of give you some of the basics of uh, crowdfunding, of the JOBS Act, and what you need to know. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the various platforms, how to conduct a campaign, uh, what you need to know with respect to uh, advertising and soliciting your offering. <clears throat> and then we're going to talk about, you know, what kinds of help uh, you uh, may need and uh, what are some of the costs involved. Okay, so high level, what we're talking about is a sea change in uh, the securities laws. That is, and again, we're talking about equity crowdfunding versus donation-based crowdfunding. So anytime you are raising, you're, you're asking money for, as an investment from folks, where they're investing money with an expectation of return based on the managerial efforts of you, the entrepreneur, that's the definition of a security. And once you are engaged in the offer or sale of a security, you become subject to a whole host of federal and state regulations. 
and the federal regulations have been on the books since 1933 when Congress enacted the Federal the Securities Act of 1933 in response to the 29 crash, the Great Depression, and so we have had, it's a highly regulated activity. And literally for 90 years since 1933, there have been restrictions on the ability of entrepreneurs to raise capital from the public without registering with the SEC in a process that's very similar to that identical to that that a company must undertake when it does an IPO. It's a process that, you know, today costs hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in fees, legal fees, accounting fees, uh, just to uh, register a company for an IPO. So I mentioned Lee for, you know, the 20 years that I was with Lee and about 15, 20 years before that, Lee and I would represent early stage folks but because of the restrictions on their ability to raise capital, our, cl our classic client in the South Bay were two young entrepreneurs, uh, well, actually not even so young, mid-level uh, entrepreneurs who were working in aerospace, toiling away in their garage at night, you know, had managed to amass some savings. Their college buddies were in their mid-careers. They had some savings. And they were pretty much limited to soliciting those people because under the rules prior to this Monday, you had to have a pre-existing relationship with the people you were soliciting if they were non-accredited. And even if they were accredited, there were restrictions on your ability to freely solicit. As of Monday, two days ago, for the first time, entrepreneurs can now actually solicit and accept money from non-accredited investors. And a credit, a, an accredited investor is somebody defined with in the case of an individual with a net worth of a million dollars, excluding home equity, or 200,000 in annual income, or 300,000 in joint income for the last two years. So for the first time, the kind of the world of investing in this asset class, early stage investments, has opened up you know, to the general public. So it's a very significant change. Um, OK, Title III is the. Um, is the exemption that I mentioned that allows folks to do what's commonly referred to as crowdfunding. So what are the basic requirements? Well, number one, you can only raise up to a million dollars in any 12-month period. Uh, number two, there are restrictions, investment caps, on the amount that individual investors can invest. There's kind of a $100,000 threshold, both net worth and net income. If you either make uh, well, let's put it this way. If you make above 100000 in net income and you have 100000 or more in net worth, excluding your home equity, you qualify for the higher cap. And that cap is 10% uh, of you, your net worth or net income uh, up to $100,000. So the investment cap, the higher level investment cap is not insignificant. You can invest up to this amount in any 12-month period in any crowdfunding offering. If you don't meet those that $100,000 threshold, it's a lower investment cap <clears throat> of, it's, five, it's the lesser of 5% of your net income or net worth uh, up to $2,000. Um, so it's a much lower investment cap. All right, the other requirement is that you have to go through a portal that is registered with the SEC uh, or a broker dealer. Start Engine is one such portal. Uh, there are many others out there. Um, let's see, there's a disclosure requirement. Uh, you have to provide a certain level of disclosure. Uh, the SEC has provided a kind of a form uh, for you to complete. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's not quite a question and answer form, but it provides a pretty good outline of the kinds of disclosures that you're required to make and provide to investors and uh, file with the SEC. But unlike the registered off offering that IPOs are required to go through, and unlike uh, another exemption that the Jobs Act provided, Regulation A+, which we'll talk a little bit about as well, there's no review by the SEC, there's no review by the state. So these offerings are not reviewed by uh, any government uh, regulatory body prior to uh, uh, being unleashed on the public. 
um, the the portals will do some level of re review and we'll talk about that. Uh, there are some other requirements or financial statement requirements. We're going to talk about that. Um, there's a significant requirement that has been overlooked a little bit, and that is there is a restriction on general solicitation. So the only solicitation that you can do is through the portal, and that's why the portal is so important to these offerings. You can use means of communication that the portal offers to communicate with its registered users, but you're not allowed to do any kind of general solicitation or general advertising with one exception, and that exception is a one-page notice. The SEC will allow you to publish anywhere. You can take out an ad in the Wall Street Journal. Um, it, as long as you don't include soliciting material, you can only, it, it has to be purely a notification that the company is doing an offering, and then there's a URL where, uh, of the portal where if anyone is interested, they can go if they're not registered, they have to register, and only then can they access the soliciting material, which these days is probably going to be a video, uh, the, offering doc, the offering circular that you're required to um, uh, file with the SEC, and any other kind of collateral um, soliciting material that the company may want to provide. Um, you know, and that's kind of, at a high level, that's pretty much it. These rules were, they're not you know, DIY, they're not intended to be do-it-yourself, but the SEC recognized that at these levels of financing, you know, you're probably not going to have the whole army of lawyers and accountants that you would in a registered offering. So they've made them user-friendly um, and to the SEC's credit. It took them a long time, as, as many of you know. The Jobs Act was enacted in April of 2012, and it's taken them this long to write the rules. But I think they've done a good job. You know, there's some, some uh, people have criticized them, uh, and there are some difficulties. I think they could, you know, in certain areas they could have been better. But uh, they're here, and we have them, and they're here to use. And I think that uh, if used properly, I think it's going to be an excellent vehicle for people who otherwise weren't able to access capital to get that critical seed 250, 500, up to a million necessary to validate their technology, get a first contract, do, some, do what it takes to get in front of you know, other capital sources, whether it be angels or institutional um, investors. All right, I've talked enough. So let me <coughs> start with Alan. Um, so one of the critical questions is uh, which platform do I use? Because you can only use one. You, not, you, you may not use multiple platforms. The, cons the reason being the SEC wants everybody, the crowd, to vet the offering in one place. So Alan, would you tell us um, what sorts of, um, what is Start Engine's competitive advantage and what kinds of services does it offer to entrepreneurs who um, you know are just starting out and um, um, are looking to looking for help in getting the campaign, getting the word out. Great, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I'd love to talk about our competitive advantage. So, uh, Start Engine actually kicked off June of last year under Regulation A Plus, and that's when the Ilya Motors campaign launched on our platform with CrowdfundX when Regulation A Plus was enacted. And that is a different regulation where you can raise up to $50 million from now non-accredited investors and accredited investors, but there's a lot more regulatory cost involved. You actually have to be authorized by the SEC. You need to be audited instead of financially uh, reviewed. So there's a lot of cost involved. So it takes a significant amount of capital to even go through that process. However, it allows companies like Elio Motors to raise a significant amount of money from a significant amount of investors. And we're not talking about 20 or 30 um, accredited investors that are pooled through an equity crowdfunding platform that you guys might be aware of, like a Flash Funders or AngelList. We're talking about they raised $17 million from 6,600 investors. And those 6,600 investors, it takes a lot of work on the back end from a technology platform side to be able to transact all of that work and process it and the agreements that we have with different third parties 
to make all of that um, clear effectively. So that's the benefit um, or the competitive advantage of Start Engine is we are the only platform that has closed and raised a company under the new Jobs Act, which was under Regulation A+, and we have the wherewithal in order to complete that effectively because it takes a lot of work on the back end. And there were some hiccups, don't get us wrong, but we were the first ones to do it. We have the processes in the, on the back end to be able to do it. And um, that's, where we, that's where we differ. Um, one of our other competitive advantages is we have the team that knows how to do it. Um, we, our our co-founder is a guy named Howard Marks who co-founded Activision from his dorm room in Michigan. Our CEO, Ron Miller, is a seasoned entrepreneur with um, exited about four different companies. And we also have um, a woman named Amanda Carmichael who actually came from CrowdfundX who worked on their Helio Motors campaign, um, was the point person. Now she's on our back end full time. So she be, she's able to guide the issuers or the companies, we call them issuers, through the entire process. Because once my job is complete and they're interested and they're going through the process of uh, raising capital and start engine, there's a whole lot of work on the back end. So we have the effective team in place. We're the only platform that has done it. And it's a very new space and there's a lot of work to be done. So that's where we stand right now. Great, thank you. So Taylor, I'm gonna ask you next to um, talk a little bit about the actual campaign, but let me just, on um, Regulation A+, which was another one of the offering methods that the Jobs Act uh, created. Actually, Regulation A has been on the books for a long time, but the limit was five million. There were a lot of other restrictions, including the requirement to qualify your offering in every single state. Each state has its own set of securities laws. And before the JOBS Act, there really was no way to conduct an offering without qualifying your offering in every single state, which was part of the reason it, offerings were so expensive. You had to hire lawyers to do this. What the JOBS Act did is it preempted state review of certain Regulation A offerings, and it preempted state review of all Title III crowdfunding offerings. So there is no state requirement other than possibly a notice requirement uh, that you have to comply with um, now since the JOBS Act. Uh, Regulation A plus is the offering exemption that I mentioned and Alan mentioned that requires that you have the SEC qualify the offering statement. That process is very similar, a similar process to the registered registration process that a company doing an IPO must go through. So that, as Alan mentioned, requires um, a lot more regulatory review, a lot more preparation, but you can raise up to $50 million. Um, the other thing that Regulation A-plus allows you to do is something called test the waters. So because you cannot actually sell under Regulation A-plus until your offering is qualified with the SEC, you can uh, do some preliminary testing the waters, preliminary solicitations to see if people might be interested in an offering the idea being that you can do this before you incur the expense of qualifying your offering with the SEC. And so um, Taylor was involved in Elio Motors' Test the Waters early uh, campaign. Um, the testing the water, there is no testing the waters with crowdfunding under Title III because there's no qualification. Once you file your offering document with the SEC, you're good to go. You can start soliciting. You can't, cannot start soliciting until you file that document with the SEC. But since there's no review period, since your offering is effective as soon as you file with the SEC, there's really no concept of test the waters. So basically what you'll be doing is you will find the platform. You will have, have in advance, um, you know, hopefully talked to uh, some, uh, gotten some counsel you would have talked to an accountant because as Dean's gonna tell you, there are financial statement requirements. But once you've done that, you find your platform, the platform helps you file the document with the SEC, that's when your campaign begins. So Taylor, um, why don't you explain a little bit about the campaign? What is it that makes an effective campaign? And what, are, um, what do folks really have to do to be successful in getting the word out about their equity crowdfunding offering. Sure. Uh, I want to go back to some of the misconceptions that were listed initially. 
Uh, and the one that really stuck with me that I feel is really often overlooked with a lot of people who want to crowdfund is the idea that the crowd is waiting for you on the platform. It's not. On average, the community on a crowdfunding platform often accounts for about 6% of the total raise, which means that 94% needs to come through the crowdfunder or whoever the crowdfunder hires efforts to drive people to that page. In essence, if you're crowdfunding, you need a crowd to do the funding. And so one of the first things that I'll often ask if I'm talking to someone about, uh, if I'm vetting someone who comes to me with a crowdfunding project is, who, who do you have that cares about what you're doing? How big is your email list? How big is your, your social media following? Do you, have, do you have partnerships? Do you have relationships? Do you have influencers who will promote your campaign for you? Uh, if the person says, I don't have any of that, but I want to raise half a million dollars, you've got some work to do. And, and that's really the first step in creating a successful campaign is starting to build that momentum, starting to build that excitement. Because there are a lot of platforms out there, there are a lot of people crowdfunding, and you need to find a way to get above that noise and, and to make an impact with, your, with the ideal demographic who can fund your project. Um, so what we'll suggest is start building out that email list, start, um, start running a social media campaign, start getting people aware of your brand and starting to seed the fact that three, four months down the line, we're going to be launching this crowdfunding campaign for this exciting new product and we want you to be part of that. Um, and then when you get to that point, hopefully you have enough people around you so that on day one, you can raise about 33, 25 to 33% of your goal. Um, if you're able to do that, You've got a perception of success, you have momentum, and you're going to be able to put yourself in a position to succeed. Uh, if you launch the campaign and after day three you've raised 1% or 2%, even people who are really excited about your product are going to look at it and say, something's weird here. Why is no one else caring about this? I'll, I'll, I'll bookmark it, I'll come back in two weeks, and I'll see what's happening then. Um, but if you're, if you're able to get the crowd excited, if you're able to raise that initial money, and you're able to continue communication with your backers as you move through the process, uh, you'll be in a, in a very strong position to succeed. Taylor, let me ask you, because I, I've, I've seen one of the criticisms is that there is this whole cottage industry of consultants and advisors to crowdfunders. Um, how important is it to have uh, kind of some advice about the campaign, social media campaign? I think it's very important. Um, you know, certainly there's the, the vast majority of people who run a crowdfunding campaign probably can't afford a full agency to come on and handle a lot of the heavy lifting for them. But uh, what I would certainly suggest would be, um, you know, the, the number one thing you need is a team. You need eight to 10 friends, at the very least, who you can assign tasks to. And you can have you know, sending emails every day or messaging all their Facebook friends every day just to create this, this grassroots awareness of, of what you're doing. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, and then certainly to, get, to educate those people on what needs to happen when. Uh, I definitely see value in having uh, you know a single consultant come on board at least for a weekly call and say okay this week this is your these are your tasks um, but like anything like you say it, it is a cottage industry there's people who do it incredibly well and there's people who probably do it a little bit suboptimally <laughs> so um, certainly you know if, if that's a road you want to go down and you want to speak with you know you, you want to work with someone like a start engine that would it would be it would behoove you to talk to them and say this is you know, we're looking to hire somebody to come on board and just kind of guide us through this process. Who do you recommend and then can steer you in the right direction? Yes, I think it's critically important that you get some help. I'm going to ask James next to tell us about, you know, uh, how the difficulties that he had um, in launching his own campaign, social media campaign. Um, but one thing to note is James's campaign was 
a non-equity campaign. And so what's critically important is that you get help by somebody who understands equity crowdfunding because there are a number of restrictions and there are a lot of ways that you can step on minefields. For example, you know, this issue that I mentioned about restriction on general solicitation and not being able to advertise before you file. So, um, you know, one issue with the JOBS Act is this restriction and somewhat inconsistency in the law that you can do all this advertising through the platform, but you cannot do a general solicitation yourself. So it becomes critically important, for example, to get onto the platform and while you may not and probably will not launch, actually launch the campaign from day one, you do have to file with the SEC the requisite disclosure document before you can start kind of advertising and conditioning the market. Um, so let me ask James now to tell us a little bit about kind of the trials and tribulations that you went through in a non-equity crowdfunding campaign where there really are no restrictions. There are no regulations, uh, no securities regulations, and other than maybe Federal Trade Commission regulations on fair advertising, there's very little regulation when it comes to taking donations. Um, but tell us a little bit about your experience in, in that regard. Um, <clears throat> hello. Okay, uh, so I did a uh, crowdfunding project on the, a campaign on Kickstarter on starting March of last year. And yeah, like uh, Mark said, the whole process was uh, very easy. You just uh, go to kickstarter.com, sign up a user's account. And uh, as a Kickstarter, once established a user's account, you can back other campaigns if you wish, and you can also start a new campaign. All you have to do is uh, just click on the create campaign. Now you're all set, you're filling the um, parameters for your campaign. You set your funding goal. Uh, you set your funding period. Uh, typically, it's around 25 to 45 days. And then um, you select which category you would like to list your campaign under. On Kickstarter, I think a couple of main categories would be art, technology, and um, media, uh, photography, or um, uh, films, films like that. Um, so um, uh, we uh, like um, um, he, he just mentioned um, you need to build up a strong following prior to your campaign launch and I, I did read about that uh, before launching but I didn't take it too seriously I bought some uh, Facebook uh, ads and created a Facebook page and um, before the launch we were able to gather about uh, 500 uh, follow 500 likes people who yeah uh, support your cause um, but of the 500 I believe only roughly 250 to 300 were uh, actually um, real people the other might be just some um, well yeah they have some other <laughs> ulterior purpose yeah um, uh -huh. um, so the um, I think the uh, formula to success with a uh, Kickstarter campaign is the traffic and um, conversion, these two factors. Uh, with the traffic, um, consensus is that the Kickstarter platform will provide you about uh, only about 30 to 40 percent of the uh, traffic. The rest you'll have to manage by yourself from your own followings or from your uh, marketing media push. And uh, regarding to conversion, conversion is the um, ability to persuade users once they land on your campaign page to um, yeah, persuade them to commit and uh, give you the money for your campaign. So the, um, the, the tools you use is the, uh, primarily the video and the descriptions and um, the, like a, a good photography images that you use on your campaign. And because um, Kickstarter has be, is getting more and more popular every year, so the competition is quite fierce. So these uh, video and the um, description media uh, uh, co marketing collaterals that you put up there has to be really high quality in order to pers persuade them. Um, so as far as our, our campaign went, uh, we set our 
uh, campaign goal at 150,000, and in hindsight, it was was pretty high for our type of uh, product, which is a uh, a very unique uh, tablet mounting system. Uh, we we're only able to raise uh, twenty thousand um, dollars. So, um, in the hindsight, um, yeah, everything um, from building your own crowd and preparation of the um, presentation materials was um, not very adequate. But we, on the bright side, we did get some um, good uh, insight to set our future direction for our company. Um, we learned that uh, most uh, backers actually um, selected the uh, most, uh, the, hi the highest price uh, reward in our package. So that was uh, encouraging to know that our product has support at that price point. And we also learned from communicating with uh, backers that um, the price point we're looking for is um, better suited for professional and industrial niche. So we've uh, adjusted our focus and redesigned our product to meet that purpose. Yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's very impressive to me that, I mean, to me, uh, Kickstarter and donation base is truly hat in hand. And if you can go out and hat in hand and raise 20 grand, that's pretty impressive. You know, particularly because I would assume that with most donation-based campaigns, people are investing smaller amounts of money than they would in a equity campaign. And so let me ask Alan, uh, on, on Start Engine, is there any minimum amount that uh, the company must impose uh, on the investor? Um, you know, is there any minimum, 100 bucks, or, or not? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. A lot of companies ask that, and that's really one of the benefits of Start Engine is that we are not a broker dealer. We are just a funding portal, a true safe haven marketplace for companies to come onto our platform and go straight to market and offer securities um, in their raise. And to answer your question, uh, each company sets their own minimum. So each company has can, has the ability to set their own minimum. They're able to set their own um, type of raise in terms of what you can offer. You can do a debt round or an equity round, um, which would be a convertible note or um, shares. And it's the, the main, one of the main competitive advantages besides opening up the investor pool under the JOBS Act, where now non-accredited investors, now the 97% of Americans who are not accredited investor status have the ability to invest in your startup that's the, that's the one benefit. The other benefit is that the terms for each company is completely on their, uh, up to them. So the minimum investment, we can talk to um, Taylor in terms of strategy of a, from a crowdfunding campaign standpoint, but the real benefit is that your round of fundraising is completely on your terms. There is no haggling with venture capitalists or into institutional money. Um, you're able to set what type of rights, um, and we've, pretty commonly seen non-voting common shares as the type of security offered in equity crowdfunding rounds. Um, but you can set a minimum depending on what you feel is an adequate price point of your demographic of the people that you're going out to, whether that is $300 or for Elio Motors, it was $600. Um, and to kind of give you some statistics on that campaign, the minimum investment Paul Elio set was $600 the average investment that came in was $2,800, and he had 6,600 investors. So at Start Engine, we were thinking, um, you know, how many people, and we saw a lot of people come in at that $600 mark. So how many more people, how many of those people would come in if the minimum investment was $1,000 or $1,500? There could be a lot of money left on the table there, but you know, that's that's up for debate. But that's real. That's the real benefit and flexibility that. Start Engine offers for each company is that this raise is completely on your terms, and a lot of companies find that very encouraging. Great, um, yeah. I think one, you know, one of the misconceptions was this issue about having a large number of investors when you, you know, you when you have smaller investment amounts, and people have said, well, you know, VCs aren't going to like it because it'll mess up your cap table, and you know, having so many investors will be unwieldy. Um, you know, I've heard VCs say that while that may be true, that the lawyers can handle that, which is true. I mean, this is one area where you probably need a little advice in advance. Alan mentioned non-voting common stock. 
you know, there are probably some other uh, things that you ought to do, for example, have contractual lockups so that if the company goes public, there, these investors are subject to a six-month hold um, because otherwise the underwriter may be concerned about the overhang, the share, number of shares out there that are available for sale once the company does go public. Um, other mechanisms like that to address the issue. There's the administrative burden of dealing with a large number of shareholders, but in my experience, after the initial raise, and you answer the initial questions, and it's true that probably the smaller investors have the most questions, but once you answer their questions and you know you set up a uh, systematic way to publish information and, and be transparent, uh, they largely will go away. And then finally, the large numbers also validate, as James has said, uh, and VCs have told me that they like the fact that you know, the crowdfunding campaign can validate a product or technology. Mark, do you mind if I touch on that sure. for one sec? Because that's actually a common pain point that I find talking with um, companies, uh, promising entrepreneurs. And they say, well, there's this issue of the cap table. And that's the huge venture capitalist stigma of having too many people on the cap table. And what does that really mean before the JOBS Act? That means when a venture capitalist looks at your cap table, who's invested, and they see a lot of names on it, that means those people have tag-along rights. They have preferred shares because that's what was pr uh, preliminary offered. And think about it. If you're an angel investor, you're a venture capitalist, you're not going to get in, invest some of your money in a young company without some certain rights along with it. So you have to kind of ask yourself, what's more important? I, I was just speaking to a promising entrepreneur yesterday at the USC Venture Summit, and he was kind of initially turned off about equity crowdfunding because of this VC stigma that he knew uh, you know, institutional money doesn't like a lot of names on the cap table, and it's, it's really simple. What's more important to you, a cap table or traction? Because nobody's going to invest in you if you don't have traction. And if you have numbers on your cap table, under this equity crowdfunding rule, the JOBS Act, those people, although they may be 6,600 people, they all have non-voting common shares, which VCs and institutional money knows that, that can, their preferred shares, their tag-along rights, can sit right above that. So there is, th there is that common perception, but it's pretty easy to quell, in my opinion, um, where it's, you know, and, and that's really the benefit of crowdfunding and the vessel that the JOBS Act allows is now that you have the proof to go to VCs and say these people have non-voting common shares, you don't have to worry about their piece in the company. And oh, by the way, I have thousands of brand ambassadors, engaged, vested <coughs> consumers um, and investors in my company that now have an interest to not only um, you know, be interested in my company and want to see my product come to market if you're pre-revenue or, or prototype per se, but now they have a vested interest to go out to their network, spread out the word. And that brand ambassadorship we're seeing is very strong with Ilya Motors who closed because these people do have a vested interest. So I'm glad you kind of brought up that point and that's something that I speak about pretty much daily to companies and entrepreneurs who have that question. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, this is going to be, uh, that, that is crowdfunding is going to change the way private companies are, are capitalized. I mean, I think you can probably imagine before Indiegogo and before we had uh, donation-based crowdfunding, film producers probably could not imagine having, uh, you know, at the end of the film uh, with the credits, having like pages and pages of people's names who donated to the, you know, create the film. And I think uh, increasingly, you know, there's been a lot of talk about democratization of venture capital and uh, Uberization of finance. Maybe that's, you know, going a little far, but I do think that we're going to see private companies more widely held simply because the securities laws in the past were too restricted and people couldn't invest in private companies. So, Dean, you've been sitting there very quiet. <laughs> Let me uh, ask you, because I know you have a lot to say and a lot to share, uh, to talk a little bit about the financial statement requirements to do a crowdfunding offering and what you really need to do uh, to prepare uh, for um, the accountants. Because under the JOBS Act, if you're going to raise over $100,000, you need to get uh, your financial statements reviewed by an outside CPA. And so, Dean, uh, tell us what a review is, 
maybe distinguish from an audit. Um, under the rules, if you're using the crowdfunding rules for the first time, you only need to get a review. Um, as I say, if you're raising over 100,000, if you're raising up to 100,000, the financials just need to be self-certified. Um, and Dean can talk about what that entails. But um, if you use the crowdfunding camp, uh, rules more than once, uh, it, the, then you need to actually provide audited financials if you're going to raise 500,000 or more, uh, up to a million. But the first time you do a crowdfunding campaign, the SEC has said, we'll just allow you to use, to have a review. So Dean, what is a review? Yeah, I'm definitely going to answer that, what is review. I just wanted to touch upon one thing, and the first, it's just a couple themes that you've talked about. Um, I heard transparency, and I heard validation, and this is the financial piece of both of those, right? So a review means that your CPA is going to, it's defined by doing inquiry and analytics, right? So we're going to look at your financial statements, and we're going to ask questions and do a bunch of analytical procedures to see if those numbers on your financial statements make sense. It's a lesser type of assurance. A review is not an audit, right? So we're going to look at everything and we're going to say, hey, does it make sense that you, know, you raised $200,000? Okay, so why is your bank balance X? Why is your, you know, your equity position Y? And we'll make, the, make sure that your financial statements make sense. With that said, in a review, you're not exactly pulling up all of the source documentation, right? We're, we're not required to go through and pull a bunch of invoices and go directly to the source documentation. That is what we do in an audit. So over the $500,000 threshold is an audit. And that's where there's a lot more work to be done. Um, we are actually going to tie back all of the balances directly to the source documents. We're going to look at bank statements. We're going to look at your equity agreements. We're going to look at everything you have and make sure that everything is accounted for correctly. Um, so an audit is much more work. With that said, if you have the ability, say, you know, you're going to go higher than it, it, it picks up and you get more than, you know, your next round, all of a sudden you're at, you're at 450 or you're at 400,000 and you're saying, gosh, I think an audit, because it's more work, is going to be more expensive than a review. Well, you know what? If you have the ability to generate over that $500,000, go do it, right? Because it's not that much more, right? You're talking about um, on an entry level, a review could be, depending on the size of the firm that you use and what their qualifications are, you could find people to do a, a, a crowdfunding review for you know $6,000 or so. Um, now, if you went to a large firm that, that's registered with the PCOB, that is regulated by the SEC, you're looking at you know ten to twelve thousand dollars. But if you're looking at an audit, the difference in price for a very small firm could be nine thousand. So you're talking about a four thousand dollar difference in price from a review to an audit, and you're going to generate potentially several hundred thousand dollars more of financing. Um, for your for your organization, so that type of return and cost structure, you're looking at it like if you have the ability, go do it. Now, with regards to keeping up your books, um, I think you know we, we talk to a lot of people out there, and and they're saying, hey, gosh, what, what's the administrative cost burden? And we look at it like, um, you know, you're you're taking investor money, right? You're taking people's money. Please don't come to us with an Excel spreadsheet and say, "Hey, this is what I've this is what I've raised, and this is where I spent my dollars," right? Because you're going to need a whole lot more than that. At least, at least, I mean, and, and accountants really hate QuickBooks, but at least get into QuickBooks, right? At least have something to show that you could actually um, be transparent with your investors on a um, on a reporting basis that is is, is uh, very normal, um, so that you can provide that. So. That's really our big thing. And, I, and, and then when you think about a CPA, I think the first thing that people do, and we see it all the time, is they say, I'm going to go crowdfund X or Y product. I raised 500 grand, lucky me. And uh, well, let's just say 400. I raised $400,000. And they go to their mom and pop tax CPA down the street, and they say, hey, guess what? I did this crowdfunding thing this year. 
and I raised 400 grand, and now I need this thing called a review. And that tax CPA says, oh, you did? That's, that's cool, you're doing crowdfunding, okay. Uh, so how many investors are in there? And they're gonna hear about that, and they're gonna be like, whoa, you've got how many investors for $400,000, and now you want me to put my name on that. I don't know how comfortable I, I feel about that. So we really say, you know, it's really good to work with an expert who knows what you're doing, because if that product does take off, your, your issues are going to get complex very fast, and you're going to want to have someone who can give you that validation. So, um, OK, and what does it mean to be, you mentioned PCOB registered versus not. Uh, what is that? And uh, sure. tell us what that is. So PCOB registered, here at Armenino, we audit public companies, companies that are you know, traded on, on uh, the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. And uh, because of that, the SEC has set up something called the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, meaning because of things like Enron and WorldCom and some of our larger companies that, large, you know, publicly traded companies that collapsed, um, they said that they want to regulate the auditors who are doing work for registered companies. And so we are a, a registered company. The PCOB comes in and looks at our audits of our publicly traded companies every two years, and they let us know if they have issues with the work that we do. We've taken companies public and done all of that. So we're very proud of the fact that we have a 0% error rate with the PCOB. That adds another level of validation to your organization because there are CPA firms out there. We, we have a relationship with one uh, based in the Midwest. His name is Crowd CPA. And, you know, he'll, he'll do a review for, for six grand. He'll do an audit for eight. That's not the space that, that we play in. But his deal is, is Dean, anybody who ever calls me that says they think that they really have a product that's really going to take off and they think their organization is really going to run and they want that PCOB registered firm, then I'll pass those along to you because that's not the space that I'm in. So. Yeah, the other, um, I mean, in, in addition to kind of the validation of being registered with the PCOB, uh, the, if, if you're going to be very successful and kind of uplist and register as a public company, um, as a public company, you're required to have audits conducted by a PCOB firm. And so if you were to have a, an audit uh, by a non-PCOB firm and you were successful enough to, a short time after your crowdfunding campaign, register with the SEC, you could not use those, that audit. They, those numbers would have to be re-audited by a PCOB registered firm. Um, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about cost, because Dean, thanks, you've given us some cost parameters. Uh, Alan, um, what is the kind of the pricing metrics or model of, of, of uh, portals and, and a start engine? Sure. Um, so it'll, different, uh, it'll differ based on which regulation you fall under. Um, so I guess I'll start with Regulation CF, which Mark is talking about, which um, you can raise up to a million dollars. And the real benefit for an entrepreneur in this kind of seed round is that there's a lot less regulatory cost. And um, to kind of speak on what Dean is talking about, there, there's required uh, two different aspects from a kind of SEC standpoint in order to do this um, compliant, uh, legally and, and compliantly. Um, so you need, your, uh, you need to have a legal review of your documents that you are uploading onto Start Engine or any platform. This is kind of your offering circular, if you will, um, your Form C, which is the actual document which Mark spoke about that companies fill out, which is actually kind of automated on our platform. We ask you a lot of kind of different fields in the back end, and then it kind of automatically populates into an XML um, form there. And then once you upload all of that um, material of your actual offering, then we require a legal review of that. You give your password, your login information to your lawyer, and then they legally sign off that all of the information is um, you know, to their best knowledge, factual and accurate. So you need a legal review of what you're uploading to Start Engine, and then you need a financial review 
instead of a financial audit. And we're speaking to CPAs that are right around that 5,000 to 10,000 mark. And it could honestly be less if you're a brand new company and you don't have anything on the books. And we've talked to some CPAs who understand that and they're willing to put their name on it. And some are a little hesitant because it's such a new company. But again, if it's a startup company and uh, you know they just have a prototype and they're looking to go out to raise, they don't have anything really to review. And you can go on to Start Engine and look at the financial risks of a few of their companies that are pretty early on and you'll see there's nothing in their balance sheet pretty much. Um, so the financial review and legal review costs we like to say is anywhere of $15,000 or less in order to raise up to a million dollars through this vessel. However, that doesn't take into effect what Taylor and CrowdfundX does and the entire way of raising money through a portal like Start Engine. And that is you have to find a crowd and you have to go solicit them. And Mark mentioned the tombstone marketing approach under Title III, which allows a company through whatever medium to solicit on the internet or uh, in public that they're offering securities, which is brand new under the Jobs Act, but you're doing it in a way that's very restrictive of this is, well, I'm going to use your company's example, this is J&B pop, Popcorn, we're offering this securities, go to startengine.com to learn more. That's it. So there's that cost of the legal, the financial review, and then whatever you're spending on a crowdfunding campaign aspect of it, and that's going to vary per company. But kind of in total for a company, I'd say around anywhere from, from thirty to $50,000 would be a total cost that's comfortable for raising maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars under Regulation CF. Now, Regulation A+, plus, which was enacted in 2015, what Elio Motors closed on, that's your ability to raise up to $50 million. Now, that that's great, but there's a lot of costs involved, and that's really for a particular set of companies who have that um, capital to spend. So Mark mentioned the benefit of the test the waters aspect of it, where you can come on to Start Engine at no cost. We would just require a bad actor check from anyone in your company has 20% more equity, which is um, you know under $100, and we need a legal review of your marketing materials that you're going to go out to in the test the waters campaign, which is under $1,000, just to make sure it's SEC compliant because there are some restrictions. And then you go out and test the waters. And investors come in, they reserve shares, which are called indications of interest, which are non-binding. Money does not come into escrow. And it's a good ballpark for companies to see how much traction they're getting before incurring the capital costs of going into their live offering mode. So that cost to switch over your campaign from the test the waters to live offering uh, requires the Form 1A to be filed and authorized by the SEC, and um, Dean's firm and others charge uh, probably around twenty to thirty thousand dollars for a financial audit, and uh, law firms like MSK and, and others probably charge around forty to fifty thousand dollars to create and file the Form 1A. So you're looking at a capital cost of anywhere around seventy thousand dollars to go to the live offering phase, and that is before you spend any money with a professional crowdfunding agency or doing it in-house, which could be, as Taylor knows, you know, anywhere from 50 to $150,000. And I'm sure you can talk about the actual metrics um, of now, how Alan, much excuse me. Raise. So right now you're talking about Regulation A plus offerings. Yeah, so so that was really the difference of Regulation CF. Is pr we're looking at probably a thirty to fifty grand cost, all in with campaign, financial review, legal legal review. For Regulation A plus, you can raise up to fifty million, but you're looking at costs of a um, hundred thousand dollars and upwards in order to do that. Okay, great. And so Taylor, <clears throat> can you tell us about you know what are the range of services that um, that you offer or other uh, kind of social media experts will provide, and how are the, how are those? Uh, what's the pricing model for those? Yeah, so um, from an agency standpoint, you know, often uh, we'll work on a retainer basis. So it's you know it's monthly costs for uh, three to six month engagement. And that can off easily run into the six figure range, depending on the needs of the the given campaign. Uh, for something like that, you'll get, uh, you know, for the duration of your campaign, you'll get dedicated resources that specialize 
in various aspects of that crowdfunding campaign. So you'll have a project manager, uh, social media director, uh, graphic designer, video production, ad buyer, uh, PR, blog outreach, the whole nine yards. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, there there's a whole cottage industry of consultants who can come in and uh, you know maybe for just a couple thousand dollars you know they they work in a you know a million different ways uh, or they're compensated in a million different ways each one is a little bit different but often for just a couple thousand dollars you can connect with people on a weekly call uh, and they will guide you and your team through the process uh, I personally, I, I feel like one of the themes that we've talked about here that I think is very, very important is when you're crowdfunding, before you hire anyone, know what you're looking for. You know, if you're trying to raise, if you want to have a, a $10,000 documentary you know, and you have no money up front, then that puts you in a different category of consultant. If you're an Elio Motors, then that puts you into a different category, but certainly regardless of what your goals are and what your vision is, do it right. I mean, that is, it's absolutely crucial because whether it's a reward campaign on a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or an equity campaign, it's your baby and it's out there. And you can't, it's not a website where you can't just pull it away again. You know, if, it, if you crash and burn or if you run into legal and financial issues down the line, that's your company, and that's going to have a huge impact of you, and it could potentially be fatal for you in the long run. Well, so, the lawyers call that evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you do, if you do have an amazing vision for a project that that has the crowd and you know is is on the path to success, make sure that you bring on the right. You know, make sure you work with these guys up here to to. Put yourself in a position to succeed because the last thing you want to do is try to be cheap up front uh, or cut corners and end up uh, paying for it down the line.